So in particular, I would like to focus on water and wastewater plans, current existing plans and um, into the future. So um, has, if everyone's got a copy, if we can go to um, the second page, basically just the Great Lakes, um, just I'm sure you all know this, 20% of the world's freshwater resources, only two to 3% is a renewable resource, the rest was, is a glacial uh, deposit. Uh, and I guess we need to think about what the climate change impacts are going to be on lake levels. And with a particular focus, you'll see I've put a, a pin where Lake Simcoe is. It's a tiny little lake compared to the rest of the Great Lakes. It's a fairly um, shallow lake, so it doesn't contain that much water. Uh, <clears throat> so just sort of put that into focus, and then the next page, um, I'm sure you, some of you may not be aware, but your region since 2005 um, has been permitted to have what's called an intra-basin transfer, which is movement of water from the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay watershed uh, down to Lake Ontario. Um, and that um, diversion of water is allowed under the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Sustainable Water Resources Agreement. I was on the Annex Advisory Panel while this agreement was being negotiated and York Region made presentations to the panel um, and it was grandfathered at that point in time. But, um, and so you can see the next page points to the fact that York Region has permission and is diverting 19 megaliters a day uh, of Lake Simcoe watershed water down to Lake Ontario. Um, <clears throat> So the next slide shows basically the plans going out to 2031 and from your region's website. Um, this is the preferred alternative um, and it's, in, its general intent looks good because finally there's going to be a sewage treatment plant on the south side of Lake Simcoe so that water can be taken from Lake Simcoe and returned to Lake Simcoe. However, it's not going all the way down to the hydrological divide. The hydrological divide is that squiggly line that goes uh, south of Aurora. Um, so you can see that the um, uh, infrastructure is still going to be diverted south uh, to uh, Lake Ontario. And the final slide is showing um, the amounts of wastewater being transferred it's hard to tell how much diversion is going to be allowed under this plan up to 2031, uh, because you have to do the math. You have to remove, uh, deduct the water transferred from the wastewater returned, but in that wastewater also goes stormwater, and it is the stormwater that is really the transfer um, or diversion, and it's difficult to tell what that amount is, but just looking at these very large numbers for wastewater, from that middle section, from the Aurora area that will be moving south, it appears that that 19 megaliters a day diversion will have to be increased. These plans, um, I understand, have not completed environmental assessment, but they also, if that increase um, is going to be allowed, it has to be granted by the signatories to this big um, Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Sustainable Water Resources Agreement. And that means it has to go to the governing body and all of the governors from the eight Great Lakes state and Ontario and Quebec have to agree to it. And as far as I know, that process hasn't even started. So uh, just so you know, there is a community way over in the west side of Lake Michigan that was finally granted permission for an intra-basin transfer, a new one, after 10 years of deliberation and public comments. That uh, diversion, that area, that community sits right on the hydrological divide and their groundwater is contaminated with radon. So they meet the exceptions criteria. This diversion does not meet those exception, exception criteria, so it's going to be a challenge to get any increase in that 19 megaliters per day diversion. So that's, that's our concern. Um, we need to treat the Great Lakes water with all water um, with a great deal of caution facing climate change impacts and particularly Bill 66 wanting to place um, infrastructure or require infrastructure for new employment lands where it's currently not designated for employment lands.
That's the essence of, of our concerns, and I... I think, I believe what you're saying is that the Upper York would trigger a requirement for an agreement under the Great Lakes Agreement, um, but I would see the Upper York as reducing the interlake transfer and therefore not requiring one. I, mean, I, thought it would, I thought the agreement is required if you're increasing your transfer, not decreasing. That's right. I'm probably that's, simplifying things. That's correct. But I'm just, that last slide, you can see the middle section there, that area is still going to be covered by uh, water from Toronto and wastewater returned down to the Dolphins Creek. Why were you referring to a 10-year time frame to achieve one of these agreements if, if we don't need one for the upper York? Because if that intra-basin transfer is increased and it's not clear from the documents posted on York Region's website whether that increase is going to, if, if, whether there is going to be an increase, but just looking at these numbers, it looks like there would be. Okay, so then maybe I just go through staff and just clarify. Yeah. I would have thought that New York would have reduced. And I just remember you, you uh, want to be finished? Well, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm having a little difficulty connecting this larger picture with Bill 66, which is the yes. uh, agenda. I don't item. disagree. Um, and, uh, but however, I have the greatest respect for Ms. Meter and her association. We share concerns about Great Lakes water quality, and I would suggest that if uh, Commissioner Mahoney and her could have this conversation offline, it might be much more conducive to settling this issue of interbasin transfer. This was a matter before Council several years ago, and uh, we have a very strong background in that area and a compelling background to uh, seek that uh, hydrological balance. Thank you. Councilor Martel, you have any other to say? Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Miller will work I, with. Just quickly, if I can share from Commissioner Mahoney, if, if, if we anticipate the need under this work for an Ms. Mahoney? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, Mayor Taylor's interpretation of the approvals requirement is correct, that uh, one of the advantages of the Upper York project that's been recognized by the province in their government review is the uh, reduction of an interbasin uh, transfer. We did in um, six years ago, we were the first to create with the, the province under the agreements that uh, the deputant is referring to, and we went through the full prior notice and consultation with all the affected uh, Great Lakes states and got our interbasin transfer approved. And that interbasin transfer is required because as, as uh, committee members know, um, we purchase 80 to 90 percent of our drinking water uh, from Peel in Toronto and to move that Lake Ontario drinking water north of the divide requires uh, them to have and, and us because uh, we're the ones doing the transfer to allow that water to, to move north. We do have some return flow going back to uh, Duffin Creek, but with Upper York, um, more of the, the groundwater and the, the Lake Simcoe uh, water that's uh, removed for drinking water will be returned um, to Lake Simcoe through the Upper York project. So in fact, the, the, um, the amount that's permitted, we don't need to exceed. Our current transfer is less then we got fully permitted through the prior notice and consultation um, process with all Great Lakes states. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I too was having trouble making the connection yeah, between the uh, Upper York uh, treatment plant, etc., and Bill 66. Can I try to summarize what I'm thinking you're saying? Because here we're to talk about Bill 66. And We've talked about the Upper York for a half a decade, uh, and um, right. um, what you're thinking is that Bill 66 will increase uh, industrial development and maybe down the road, maybe residential development above the divide, and that there's a greater potential because there's more uh, development from industrial commercial development and maybe possibly residential up north of the divide, and therefore the transfer potentially could increase uh, because of Bill 66. Am I summarizing your, what you're thinking correctly? You are summarizing it correctly, thank you. Ah, I would appreciate um, uh, a letter maybe from your organization or something that gets more into that 
uh, because, uh, you know, like I would say that certainly of the counselors that are here who have been here for a while, uh, we're very well aware of the Upper York and the proposals and the staff, etc. But uh, I hadn't made the connection until I made it in my head, not from you, but from me, saying, I think that's what you say. I'd appreciate more information. Uh, less on Upper York, because I understand Upper York, but the implications uh, of Bill 66. Of Bill 66. Thing, yes. Sorry. I appreciate it. Trying to be concise, um, I will briefly explain to you um, what I'm aware of happened when the Honda plant was built at Alliston. Um, there was not sufficient water for that very large factory, and I think that's the kind of um, industry that this Bill 66 is envisaging. Um, and basically what happened there, Collingwood got a grant from the province to put a bigger pipe into Georgian Bay and to send water south to Alliston uh, for the Honda uh, manufacturing facilities. Um, they, they did that at great cost. They put many T's along the way, hoping municipalities would connect to it. None have. Um, very quickly, Honda figured out they didn't need drinking water quality for a lot of their manufacturing purposes. So they didn't, in fact, take much water from Collingwood, and they got a permit to put a pipe into an adjacent river um, to use for their manufacturing processes. They quickly started draining the level of the supply of water into that river. MOE came in and said, no, you can't take this much water <coughs> out of this river. Okay. Now, I think I'm going to cut you off there. We're okay. going too deep into all that. Anything else, Councillor Heath? No, uh, but I appreciate Thank you. a little bit more, I suppose. I think that Mr. McGregor made a valid point. Maybe Ms. Reader could talk to our staff and go over some of this stuff with you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Jones just to receive the deputy at this time. All those in favor? Against the motions carried. Thank you very much. Things in there, though, that, that we collectively have asked uh, different provincial governments to undertake with relation to the, uh, the process and, and trying to um, streamline the process, which I think is good. Uh, but I, I'd like us to maybe walk through that before we deal with the individual resolutions because I'm sure, maybe I'm wrong, I'm sure some of the representatives around the table are going to talk to their resolutions or letters that we've received from the local municipality. So in advance of that though, I'd like to kind of understand a little better the, the position that, that we're putting forward. I think, by the way, there's nothing wrong for this council as we have had with uh, previous provincial governments. They always, uh, anytime we ask something from them, they take forever to get back to us. When they want to know something from us, there's always this strict deadline. Uh, as at the very least, I, I think we need to be asking the provincial government to extend uh, the deadline for comments. This is a very, and again, there's a lot in here that's good, and there's a lot that's raised a lot of questions, and I think uh, some of it has been misinterpreted by, by some, and then, and then there's just things that are unbelievable that are in here. So I, I think as a minimum, we should be asking the provincial government to give us uh, an extension to, to comment on this because even with the explanation today uh, and, and perhaps even next week, we could get a more uh, detailed uh, presentation on this. I just think it's too important uh, to sort of say, well, let's get our comments in because the deadline is this week. No, let's ask for an extension. We've done that previously with, uh, with comments and we most definitely should be doing it with this one. As much as I think there's good things in the bill for us as well. Sure. Okay, so I think what you're really talking to is E1.6, uh, yeah. uh, which is the letter, uh, uh, the correspondence from uh, Mr. Freeman. So what I'll do, uh, um, Mayor Scarpetti, I'll ask Mr. Freeman to give us uh, some Cole's notes on this uh, on his letter and, and what's happening with Bill 1, uh, with Bill 66 on that. And if you want to, uh, instead of amendment, uh, we'll put a little amendment on the back of this one to receive. And also, we would ask that uh, we ask the province for more time to uh, for consideration on our in our comments, for all comments coming back from this I'll come back to you on that one. Now, Mayor Bobalaka, before I get to Mr. Free, you wanted to pull 1.2? Because it's it's all it's no one else had pulled it, but you want to speak to it? Sure. Okay, so let's do I'll go off board a little bit because I got Mr. Freeman ready to go. I'll do him right down and I'll come back to yours, sir. Okay? Go ahead, sir. The intent of Bill 66 is to give businesses more flexibility to create jobs. Uh, it's to facilitate job creation. It enables a local municipality to pass what's called an open for business planning bylaw. And um, 
it's uh, fairly vague and broad in terms of what that would be, and we do have a number of questions related to that. Um, it, uh, it, again, is intended to streamline planning approvals, and there are a number of acts that are exempt from what would be applicable in considering an open for business bylaw. Um, so my memo, uh, my recent memo for today, um, identifies that uh, we have uh, some comments. Um, overall, we're always supportive of encouraging job growth and uh, economic development opportunities. And my understanding is the use of an open for business bylaw is intended to be rare. It is very similar to a minister's zoning order. Uh, that a, a Minister of Municipal Affairs could pass, but it is um, driven by a local municipality that may initiate this and want to have an Open for Business bylaw passed. There is some criteria that is identified. It is uh, strictly for an employment use, um, and that permitted use is intended to have a job creation threshold of 50 jobs from municipalities that are uh, that have a population less than 250,000 people and 100 jobs from municipalities with a population of more than 250,000 people which would apply in uh, our cases. Um, there are um, sometimes situations that may occur where it's appropriate to expedite some economic development opportunities. Um, however, our comments really focus on the need for some safeguards in the process that um, would need to be considered at the same time when uh, Open for Business bylaw is being contemplated. The first area, and I'll refer, I'm work, like, working through the memo um, on today's agenda and page two, um, we believe that there should be some form of public consultation for the consideration of a, such a bylaw. There is no requirement under Bill 66 for any public consultation. Notice is only given after the fact. Um, and in many cases, residents would not be aware of, of uh, an employment use that might be contemplated anywhere. Again, this applies across Ontario, um, not just in uh, the GTA, but it's, it's a, a tool that could be used across Ontario. Um, we've identified as some other safeguards that uh, respect for natural heritage features uh, needs to be maintained. Uh, we've identified some other uh, standards such as Clean Water Act, Great Lakes Protection Act, just in safeguards that are in place that, uh, you know, depending on the use, and it, it is just use specific. We don't know, you, know, you have to think about contemplating what types of uses this might be. It, it could vary. So safeguards that ensure that uh, we are protecting what needs to be, even from a public health perspective. Um, we um, are recommending, therefore, that the province identify additional criteria, put safeguards in place. Um, we do comment on the uh, very quick commenting period that the province has given us. We think that at a very minimum there should be a 60-day window for us to be able to review these types of changes to legislation. Um, and that those are all identified in our, our memo. We have an attachment to the memo that walks through in a little more specific detail some of our comments, including the need for public consultation. Um, these are tools that local municipalities can use. There does not appear to be, as part of the process, a role for regional municipalities, so regional conditions that would typically go into a development application how do we ensure that those conditions are, uh, are discussed and uh, implemented? Um, safeguards, as I mentioned, for source water protection, uh, public health, um, hazard lands, uh, natural heritage system features. Um, so there are a number of things. We do have, obviously, we plan for employment in a very comprehensive manner. We do have a number of employment lands that are vacant. We would hope that, where possible, our planned employment areas can be made use of first before going outside of that. So there is a, you know, you know, the concern that staff have, and it was reiterated a little bit in the deputation about, you know, the need for municipal services, depending on where a use and how big that use may be, what's needed in terms of, of infrastructure that may be outside of our our, our master plans or outside of our capital plan. 
So uh, those are our considerations, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Chairman. Any more questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman. So, so, Mr. Chair, um, thank you for that, and, and uh, uh, compliment uh, Mr. Freeman uh, both engaging the local municipalities and obviously a uh, very thoughtful process in, in responding to this bill. And, and I think, uh, and again, maybe hate to do this to you, but maybe for regional council, and again, uh, I can propose some wording as others can as well, uh, I think we probably need a, a resolution at regional council that, that brings this up a little bit more and is a bit more, you've done it, and, and just in your commentary, you've done it, you've done it quite well, but I think in our resolution, we need to kind of divide this bill up a little bit. Uh, and, and the processing part, the streamlining part, is something we've all been advocating for. I think uh, it's uh, our, our official plan, some of the work we've done here, certainly some of the work we've done, I can speak to Markham, it started several years ago. We're still trying to get comments out of some of the provincial agencies, even though it's been years in, in the making. And, um, and you know, we're getting there, but it, it's an inordinate amount of time, and I think it does add to the cost, and it does impact ultimately uh, the affordability of, of housing within not just your region but the, the province of Ontario. So I think in our resolution we need to really kind of make it bold and distinctive between streamlining the process uh, for approvals and then uh, concerns that I think again Mr. Freeman has articulated quite well. Uh, when I've been meeting and I know several of us have but when we've been meeting with uh, with uh, provincial ministers, uh, particularly the ones that are directly responsible for some of the elements in this bill. I've always made it very clear, Mr. Chairman, that we should have high uh, environmental standards. That, that should not be an issue. We shouldn't have to uh, disregard the environment. The main issue has been, let's determine what those are, set the parameters for what those are, but get through the process quicker. The frustration has been where we think we know what the parameters are, and then we deal with a particular application, and the commentary, the, uh, the uh, process that someone has to undergo, quite often is outside those uh, parameters, and you kind of figure, wait a minute, we're, we're and we experienced it ourselves with the bridge on Burdale, the, the councillors from Markham will know. I mean, years to get a MOE and MNR approval, even though we exceeded the standards that they set out. So, if we uh, if we experience that as a municipality, when we exceed the standards that are set, you can just imagine multiply that by all the activity that's happening across the GTA and across Ontario, as to the the, the delay that's caused on something, even when we're meeting those standards. So I don't know if I've said this well, but I think our resolution should split sort of the different components of Bill 66. When it comes to streamlining, when it comes to uh, perhaps a bit more control from the local municipality about what they see as good planning, and, and to your point, uh, you know, I guess you can trust us at the local level that our bylaw will indicate that you have to adhere to, to regional conditions, but that should be covered in the act. I mean, Again, not knowing uh, after Tuesday announce, Tuesday's announcement where things are going, but we want to make sure that the, the levels of government that have to put in uh, a response to major applications do in fact get the opportunity to insert those in the planning process. So I, I very much agree with that. So uh, the comments are good, and then I, I just, you know, I just cannot believe, and I know there's been a reaction to things like the Green Belt, again, I think some that have reacted have overreacted because they feel that we're somehow, you know, open season on the green belt. I, I think it's obvious that it's not. I think it was very specific related to the types of uses. And some, by the way, I believe, if we checked the previous resolutions of this council, again, we've even asked for certain locations within the green belt, bordering 400 series highways for the opportunity to have some economic development in those communities, so it's not open season. The other thing though I think we should, and this was made, the point was made at, at the GTA Mayor's uh, meeting just this week, a uh, fear that, that uh, under the guise of bringing employment to communities that lands get opened up, 
and then somehow it will be switched to uh, to residential in the green belt. And absolutely, I think we should be asking for very tight controls that uh, lands in the green belt, if there are lands identified either by us or by the province that are key for economic development, cannot be converted uh, in the green belt to allow or permit uh, more housing. There is more than enough land over the next 20, 30, I'll say 50 years in the GTA to provide housing uh, for the population. And I even think, uh, I have some thoughts on that, we'll save that for the yeah. strategic session, but uh, there's more than enough land to accommodate the growth that we're currently getting in the GTA, even if we were to increase uh, the numbers of, of uh, immigration, because we may have to do that in order to keep our economy strong. There's more than enough land. So uh, the comments are good. I just think in our resolution, we need to kind of make parts of it a bit more distinctive. The streamlining, the processing, what we uh, strongly support, but absolutely the, the environment needs to be protected. And um, they may turn around and say, we'll put it in your bylaw. I'm not sure that would withstand the type of uh, vigor that that would need before LPAT or any other agency that got the opportunity to hear an appeal on that bylaw. But we, we need to, or maybe you're going to tell me it can't be appealed. Okay, so that's fine. So then uh, I want to make sure that uh, that protection is there to say, and I'm not sure how it's worded in the bill because I haven't had time to check, but I'll paraphrase, but to say that development has to have no regard to the Great Lakes or to water source protection is absolutely ridiculous. So I think we need to point out the ridiculous parts of this bill in a very strong way. And in a very strong way, we need to say this is what's right with this bill because we've been asking for some of these things as municipalities to streamline the process. Okay, sir, so um, what I'm looking for is, uh, I think what we're, the main thing is uh, for all your comments is that we need to uh, have a delay in, in, the, in the approval of that asking and getting a bit more time for us to make comments. So I'll come back to you. I agree with uh, Mayor Scarpetta. I think we need to, to um, outline as clearly as possible um, the areas where we'd like to see uh, consideration for greater rigor, if you want to call it, or the additional criteria I think you referred to as the term. Mr. Freeman, uh, I guess what I, I'd also be interested in is I'm unfortunately I'm not optimistic that that's the, I, I think this bill is going forward and I'm not optimistic we're going to see change, but maybe we will, and I think we should make attempts to at least um, you know if it is going to happen then this is how it should happen kind of approach. But um, I would say I would also be very interested. Is there a, it, it, often on some of these things there's an intermunicipal planning group or working group or <coughs> coordinating with municipalities because I'd like to be ready for the next step, which is. Uh, when the municipalities have to start to deal with this and put in place some sort of uh, you know, criteria along with the bylaw, I assume, that, that the municipalities have, have had a mutual conversation about ensuring things, as Mayor Scarfi pointed about ensuring that, you know, uh, referring and getting a regional comment, uh, some of the other, so that we can build in, if, if it's not built in by the province, it, it, you know, the strength of the criteria that each community desires. But I would like to see that opportunity. And I'll finish here with one last question. It's a bit of an odd one, but I don't think it's that odd. I guess I'm curious, is there a mechanism right now to put lands into the Green Belt if someone so chooses? And the reason I'm asking that, was there ever a discussion? A lot of people talked about all oh, the Green Belt might be up for grabs. One of, a lot of people said, well, maybe there'll be a process where it's, you know, for every acre in, there's one, or out one acre's in or two acres in. Would a municipality be able to, to pursue something like that if they were wanting to deal with this after after it's passed where there's some also a requirement about um, about additions to the green belt for some, so that lands in the green belt that are prime for employment and if this is the legislation if it were to be enacted there could also be the possibility for uh, the requirement that other lands went. So through you Mr. Chairman the two questions. Uh, yes there is a, a group uh, the planning commissioners meet monthly in York Region. We collaborate on a range of things and I can tell you we've had a discussion about Bill 66 and we'll continue to do that and I think that um, if there are not safeguards that are put into the legislation itself, which I hope there is, um, we would definitely be collaborating and uh, come to an agreement I would hope on the, the, the collaboration and, and conditions that need to be considered from a regional and local perspective. With respect to the green belt and uh, if lands go in or lands add or added, uh, the green belt, um, the provinces 
um, in charge of the Greenbelt plan. There are, uh, as you know, there have been times when the province has uh, had growing the Greenbelt initiatives. They have opened up the Greenbelt for review. Uh, municipal uh, official plans are really the avenue that go beyond the Greenbelt and could uh, add to that, whether the, the province was to pick some of that up in, in uh, you know, in a, a review of the Greenbelt to add those lands, that would be something that, that sometimes and does very well happen. Um, but I think it would be up to, in the absence of that, it would be up to the municipalities and the official plans to um, identify lands that we want to protect. And I think we do. I think we already do have a very good uh, natural heritage system set up designations, not only in the region's official plan and the Greenland system, but in all of our local municipal official plans that are being updated to conform to the region's plan, we, uh, we do have that. But there isn't a trade-off or um, any provision like that in the bill. So this, this might be me, I guess I, the question I just asked it because I don't understand this as well as, as you do clearly, but would you, would you see any advantage in one of the inputs that we provide to the province is asking them to, to look at uh, some sort of mechanism that would allow municipalities who so cho chose to require that kind of formula and that, that, that they would uh, create a mechanism within the Green Bell Act to allow that process to, to add to the Green Bell. I think first and foremost there needs to be very clear criteria that you stay out of the features that right. should be protected yeah. in the Green Bell or in any of our official plans. So I would focus on that, um, on the, the level of scrutiny and protection that you know, a, a proposed use is being considered under. Um, we can certainly um, raise that as part of our comments about adding lands back in. Again, it depends on the s specific location of where that might be and uh, what, what goals we might have to compensate for that. And, yeah, okay, thanks. And perhaps there's other ways, right? I guess a municipality could require, could require that uh, a development that was wanting to pursue this, then you could require that they have to put lands into some sort of public ownership something that's not green but is still uh, safeguarding additional uh, lands that are that would be you know, an offset sir. through you mr. chairman it is is absolutely uh, contemplated that conditions would be imposed by an open for business bylaw that would be uh, determined by the local municipality and the minister so uh, there could be conditions like that that are embedded into that bylaw okay. thank you uh, Cal Heath. I really appreciate the report and uh, especially the appendix and uh, the information was very interesting and very helpful in understanding it. To be very frank, I didn't understand all the details of it. I, um, I start off with, I have a little bit of trouble with uh, page two, in the middle of page two, recognizing this, York Reason is supportive of efforts to stimulate business investment, create jobs, and this is where I have troubles with it and make Ontario competitive. Now that presumes that Ontario is not competitive now. Um, and uh, I don't think that we had any trouble, correct me Mr. Mayor, when, uh, when we brought in Honda and General Motors and a whole bunch of big businesses and there's a new one in Newmarket which I was quite pleased to see the picture of with the, uh, the uh, mayor, I'm not sure if he was there, the mayor or the deputy mayor at the time, um, and all of those kinds of things. Um, I almost gag with the, uh, uh, the name of this act. Uh, the presumption is really crazy vis-a-vis -vis York Region. Um, so I have troubles. What might prevent businesses from coming? And the provincial government has its hands on it. Uh, it's part of their responsibility. Hydro rates, and they are amongst the highest, and I admit that. And transportation issues. Councillor Ferry raised the issue about 50% um, or 60% that number uh, in York Region, saying that's the number one issue. And he's absolutely right. And it needs to be carefully analyzed. I do support some movement of small amounts of land out of the Green Belt in specific situations. Um, and that's what this is all about, the Green Belt and the Oak Ridges Marine. There's a piece of correspondence from Stovin on the matter of frontage on the 404. And uh, uh, Mayor can correct me on the number of acres, but in the last year or two, um, we worked uh, to remove, I think it's about five acres at the 404 and 19th uh, out of the Greenbelt, or I think it was in the 
Green Belt or the Oak Ridge or one of those. It's the moraine, sorry. And just to clarify, because I don't want this to be a, a door that gets opened by a lot of discussion, it was inadvertently put into the Oak Ridges Marine. It never made, met the mapping criteria that they set okay, up. So thanks. We stick to, the, stick to the letter. Yeah. But I do support Stouffville's thinking about that matter. Um, and uh, we know that uh, when Honda came, uh, they wanted to be on the 404. And they're a big, big development. So I do, would want to have to, more discussion about it. But I have no great problem with some aspects. Uh, and we know what that is. But I think our priority, Mr. Chair, is to be the environment. The mayor said it well, the Greenbelt and the Moraine, uh, and our residents support uh, um, the Greenbelt as it is now, and the Moraine as it is now. We are, are curtailed somewhat by those two, but I haven't seen the growth of the York region being curtailed too much um, by that. So I think the way the mayor said it, and I think we can send something or maybe see something from staff at the council meeting when we get to to deal with this, which is, I think, two weeks from now. Um, I think that's very important. I did have one question, and um, the and it goes back to what the chair joked about earlier, about Rouge National Urban Park. Um, the holdup in the Rouge National Urban Park uh, over the last two years, almost three, has been the final transfer of land that's in the Greenbelt and a little in the Marine um, to Parks Canada. Uh, and it hasn't been finished yet. Uh, are there any implications in this, uh, this bill, and I'm certainly not going to say the name, but in this bill, Bill 66, uh, that have implications for Rouge National Urban Park and the transfer of land and the potential of use of that land uh, for other purposes like development? Oh, I did have one more, and that, uh, Mr. Chair. The, the mayor is bang on when he says that this should be, we should be extremely strong on non-residential, that this only deals with industrial, commercial, et cetera, industrial mainly, uh, and uh, we need a resolution on that one, because if we all recall the video that was made in February with the current now premier, who was speaking to all the developers about how to get land out of the Greenbelt. He was not talking about industrial land. He was not talking about commercial land. He was not talking about anything else but residential. And, and, and that's what was the, uh, the thought where this might be coming from. So well, I'll go back to Rouge National Urban Park. Is there any implication for that in this? Okay, so Mr. Freeman, I have no idea what the question was, but go ahead, sir. So through you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, um, I want to be really clear that the only way of open for business bylaw gets uh, even contemplated is by a local municipality. So um, whether it's Rouge Park or any other lands, it would only be contemplated if the local municipality had a desire to put, in this case, an employment use um, in a particular location. So um, I don't believe Rouge Park would come up as part of that. Um, but that is just to be clear, that is the intent. It, it doesn't have to be used by a local municipality. It's a tool that would be available in the event that uh, a local municipality wanted to use it. Thank you. Uh, Member Rackers, please. I read through a 2017 uh, report from a regional council that spoke to vacant employment land inventory. And it speaks to the fact that the supply of vacant employment lands remains healthy and needs to be protected. And it states that there's over 2,500 hectares. And I'm just wondering, has that changed substantially, or is, is that currently where we sit? You, Mr. Chairman, no, that has not changed. We have over 2,500 hectares of vacant employment land. That was uh, an update that we did just last year. That means that one third of our employment lands are vacant. Well, thank you. And so, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, as Mayor Scarpetti mentioned, in regards to residential prop uh, residential lands, we have more than enough. And I feel that looking at this, we have more than enough lands when it comes to employment. And I think that uh, you know, uh, bypassing protections for the environment to to change lands, I think it's more of a need. Uh, it's more of a want than a need, and I think the development community wants certain lands. Uh, we have more than enough lands to that are that can be used and utilized currently, and so I think that that uh, bypassing these protections in the name of cutting red tape, I think, is the wrong way to go, and uh, and that's why we imposed uh, Bill 66 at Aurora, and and I hope that the uh, you know our my colleagues around the table and the, and the rest of the communities uh, go along that route because I, I think that I strongly believe that that uh, the land is there. 
They don't need the land, they want the land. And I think it's time that we tell everyone, we've set forward a vision, we've, we've created uh, an official plan where we want to put uh, employment, where we want to put industrial, and they need to follow those plans. And I think it's time that we start to stand up and say that. Okay, sure, well, thank you, and uh, uh, I'll come back to that. Each municipality is in a different position. Uh, King is 100% protected, 99.9% .9 protected Oak Ridge's Marine Greenbelt. We also have the highest residential portion of taxes, 95 to 5%. So it's about sustainability for some municipalities. And as uh, um, Mayor Scarpitti said, years, I pulled out six resolutions from our council, from regional council, dating back years, decades, saying strategic employment lands along 400 series of highways. Everybody stood up for that. And, and we're not saying there's an onslaught. And somebody said, uh, oh, this is what can open the floodgates. And I gave an example of just one situation that happened in King. And it was somebody that had came forward with a, a proposal for a very large scale uh, residential development on the Oak Ridge's Moraine. And they were trying to wiggle it as an old hamlet, an existing old hamlet dating back a hundred years. So we can prove on a map it was a hamlet area. And, 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 and I told someone, I said, our record of standing up for the Greenbelt and the Oak Ridge's Marine and good planning is very obvious. Because if we believed, or if we wanted to pave it all over, we would have said, well, yes, there's some merit in that, and we would have let them go ahead. So I was insulted when people said, well, you know, this is going to open up the floodgates. I think our record stands for itself that this council and all councils have stood up for the environment and that we've worked very hard to protect it. And I very much appreciate sending that message down to the province. But um, we have to be careful. If we say uh, no, everyone says no, then the province is going to say, well, we asked you, and you, did, you, you asked for it, we offered it to you, you didn't want it, so we'll do it. And then it comes down to, who do you trust to represent your constituents at that level? My comments. Thank you, sir, and I was going to mention that this council and previous council have stood, up, stood together and said that we needed to have development along the 400 series highways, and I think that's still, I do believe, and I'm hoping this council will continue do that because that is very critical. Uh, we've said that uh, many times, we've been to the problems on that, so I, I, I'm not sure just where, but I, I'm, a little, I'm getting a little nervous now how we're going to craft this resolution on this whole thing, but we'll come to it. Council DePaulo, please. we got a few more speakers. Uh, members of Council, we're going to break for noon, and then we've got this integrity commissioner after lunch. We will be sitting for uh, maybe a couple hours, so check your schedules uh, because the integrity commissioner is something that this council has to do has to do. You have to have this uh, meeting to go through this. So, we got a few more speakers. Go. Councilor. Being part of a municipality with, with a, that's struggling also with the ratio of employment to residential lands, not as bad, but we're 88% in residential in Richmond Hill, and, and we have some challenges, and it's primarily regarding a 404 corridor. We've got employment land set aside, and um, at 404 Major Mac, we're not talking about the Oak Ridge Marine or the Greenbelt. We're talking about um, other environmental considerations. We're talking about um, commenting from authorities that's been holding up our ability to, to put in a major employer there um, because of the, the time frame that it takes for these applications. So uh, I think Bill 66 is a response by the province that they're really listening to, to what the obstacles are for for certain municipalities to get some employment uh, going. And um, I, I think the planning commissioner, um, or the GR chief planner here said it very well. I mean, there's nothing for, no cause for alarm. We've got anything that's, that's every, anytime Bill 66 is gonna be used, it's because a municipality is, is requesting it. So this is a, a downloading, a delegation of authority from the province to the municipalities and I, I think that's where um, that's where the decision making needs to be. Uh, we all of our.
our municipalities in York Region for sure have proven that we are the best stewards of the environment. I'm very comfortable with, with our, our towns, our local tier municipalities, being the ones who are, who are making the decision and safeguarding, um, safeguarding the environment. And they're, just so others are aware, there's some very unique situations where a town might need to ask the province for some special consideration to get some jobs in their communities. Well done, sir. I think you're a valid point. Uh, we are stewards of the environment. Councillor Brown, please. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to uh, follow up on uh, Deputy Mayor De Paula and uh, Mayor Pellegrini, uh, I think our number one concern is that uh, we don't lose the ability to have a say in which of those lands uh, are converted uh, into employment. Um, if we do nothing, uh, the, the, the fear I have, and everybody should have, is that then we leave it up to the province alone to be the stewards of our environment. And previous provincial governments have demonstrated that, one, they have the power, and two, they've used that power to pull lands out of the Green Belt, out of the Oak Ridge Moraine, without our consultation. So very important for me is that, yes, as Councilor DePaula and Mayor Pellegrini said, we need to make sure that we have the say in which lands, if any, ever get developed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Mayor Court. Sorry, I was just a sneeze there at the wrong time. Um, yes, as uh, members of council know, and there's a sheet on your on your uh, desk. I haven't dealt with that one yet. I'm only dealing with number dealing with one point. I know, six. but I just I want to speak to the comments are around uh, the table. Oh, okay, go ahead. I thought you were trying to bring that. Before. No, no. I just want to mention that that that's on the table. Um, certainly, um, I'm glad to hear that uh, members of council are also concerned about the the certain aspects of Bill 66 uh, when it comes to the lack of. Uh, public consultation, I think that uh, that's huge. And I don't know why the province would even contemplate putting that into to a bill to, to allow a municipality to uh, move forward with a, a major uh, development application without uh, involving uh, um, the residents. And I think uh, that certainly uh, needs to, uh, to be adjusted. Um, I'll get into details more when we get into, into discussion of, of uh, our resolution. But I think the concern um, is that Red tape is red tape. Um, source water protection is, is not red tape. Um, source water protection we all are very familiar with and we all are very concerned about. It. And the concern I had, um, another members of council had as well, was again um, having this in, in legislation form that allows municipalities to pass development without regard for those source water protection um, plans that are put into place. Should there be some flexibility with, with the green belt? I agree, absolutely. There's some areas where, where it makes sense. Um, but I think this uh, is uh, um, going, this pendulum swinging a little too far to, uh, to, to letting anything happen, um, not anything, but to let major development occur in areas that uh, should have regard to the policies that have been in place for, for a, number, uh, a number of years. So. Um, I think we need to send that message down. Part of the other concern that, that I have with Bill 66 is that it doesn't tell us the criteria. It doesn't give us the full regulations. There's so many details that we don't know. And I think, uh, and again, part of our resolution speaks to asking the province to, to give us those, those uh, details and to allow that commenting on those details. Agreeing to something without knowing what the details are, I, I'm concerned about so. Those are my comments at this point. I just want to call for you when I call 1.7, okay? Okay, that completes all the speakers. Now, um, and just bear with me here, I just got to get an idea, Mr. Freeman. We, on your on our desk today is just a motion to receive this information. Um, if we were to craft a, uh, if you were able to craft a, a, a resolution for two weeks today for uh, council to consider, uh, if we still have the time to uh, put our time in uh, for this. So, Mr. Chairman, the uh, commenting period for Bill 66 ends on January 20th. 20? 20th. 20th. Um, so, my suggestion is, and we've outlined this in the memo, that uh, we would submit our, our memo, our, our comments to the province by the 20th. We've left, uh, we always usually do this, to say that additional comments will be forthcoming from our council. 
uh, and we can endeavor to craft a resolution for two weeks to put that in front of you to then uh, send that down to the province. But we will notify the province that additional comments will and also uh, identify now the concern that uh, additional time to comment on this uh, is something that has come up by our council and we can uh, we can identify that to the province. Okay. So we could add that, we could put a little bit firmer uh, uh, couple sentences in there about we're concerned about the timing, we want additional time. Part of your letter you're sending to the province, but we will still craft the resolution for two weeks today. Is that is that satisfactory with uh, members of council this time? We'll craft the resolution, but, but in this letter going down, we will definitely make a point of telling the province that we want additional time. Uh, you said 60 days. I think that's what you did say, sir. So I, I assume that would uh, take us into February, March, end of March, or maybe early April. Okay, that'd be fine. Okay, Mayor Scarpet. Sure, I'm fine with that approach. I just think um, um, Mayor Perks made an excellent comment, and we should insert this in now in our commentary, is that... Uh, Yes, we will provide more, more, uh, more comments on the on the bill itself. But that we also want, uh, when the regulations get introduced, we want appropriate uh, opportunity to, to comment on those regulations as well. Because quite often we're always asked to comment on the bill, and then the other shoe drops, and you realize, holy mackerel, is that what they meant? So uh, I think we should insert that commentary into that uh, memo now. Sure. Okay. So that'll be part. So I, I just got a little housekeeping. Council, you got a little, I didn't know far we were going to go with this, so uh, I just before I bring this one forward, uh, Councillor Jones, you're going to approve uh, E1.1, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, okay? Uh, when I asked you to move the direction forward, you're going to approve all those, and then because Mayor Bubbalock would like to talk to 1.1, and uh, Councillor Grassi and Mayor Quirk want to talk to 1.7, 1.2, I'm sorry, 1.2, right? So, so you remember council, so you have it straight, 1.1, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. Mayor Jones has brought those items forward this time. All those in favor? Against the motions carried. Now, 1.6 will be the same received um, by uh, Councillor Jones with the addition of comments made about the timing and uh, what was else you said there, Mayor Scarpetti, you said about the, uh, about more, regula uh, more comments when the regulation comes out. I know the clerk's got that. That's part of that letter going down and further that this uh, staff would provide a, a further resolution in two weeks' time for council's consideration. All understood? I know. All those in favor? Against the motion's carried. So that one does that. So I'm going to go back to 1E, 1 1 1.2, Mayor Babalacqua, and then I'll go to 1.7 for Councilor Grassi and Mayor Clark. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you. said that we wouldn't include a public process um, regardless of whether they wanted us to or not, we would always go to the public and make sure that they were they were heard. And the reason why I'm saying that and why I wanted to speak to this item is because there were two motions at our council yesterday that Mayor Cork will, is, will probably speak to on either both of them or just one of them. But, um, the other motion was a staff report. Uh, it was an excellent staff report that didn't deal with just one schedule within Bill 66. It dealt with all schedules within Bill 66. It was endorsed unanimously by the town of Georgina. Um, our staff re reviewed each schedule in Bill 66, and it was important to recognize that there were some sections of Bill 66 which I think were, were um, we didn't have a, uh, generous discussion, but I think most members of council, because we endorsed it, were important for our community because it gave us a little bit more of autonomy when it came to some of the issues that we had to deal with, and I'm sure other municipalities around the Bureau region would have to do the same thing. Um, so I would hope that going forward, because it's always difficult when you come to the region of New York and you have a piece of correspondence that might be circulated from uh, a meeting the day before, but you don't know the full context of the reports that were before the council at the time and how they were decided. This was brought forward, th this resolution, I fully understand it. I think it needed some more work than what was involved through. We need to talk to some more people. We need to talk to the province of Ontario. So the, I think going forward, and no deference to our clerk's department, they did what they had to do, but you need to have it in the totality of what the discussion was. And there was another report 
that was very well done. So all I would ask is that um, in the future, uh, with respect to Bill 66, that the report that was uh, endorsed unanimously by, by the town of Georgia be included in whatever discussion is coming forward here. Okay, I, I, so do we, Mr. Clerk, has sent that report uh, was sent to us, uh, both were, I guess? No, Mr. Chair, we didn't receive anything uh, official from the Georgina Clerk's Office because it was pretty short notice. We did receive a letter from North Columbia Forest Alliance, so that's included because it was relevant to this discussion today. I would imagine we'll, we'll receive something from Georgina within the next week or two, so we'd line that up with the council agenda when this item. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, all I'm saying is that our staff didn't circulate the, the uh, recommendations, which I think was part of the recommendation as part of that report to circulate it back here. So it hasn't arrived here yet, so this comes in isolation without the total picture with respect oh, to Oh, I, I, I misunderstood. So you're, do you want us to hold this down for uh, two weeks, or is that what you're saying? Or just, well, I mean, if yeah. Mr. Freeman's coming forward with some sort of future report, I would hope that this recommendation plus the original endorsed recommendation that was unanimously approved by the town of Eugene okay. be included in that report. Okay, so maybe by then we'll, we'll have some comments from all of us about that. Okay, Thank so you. just a motion to receive, but okay. Thank Mayor, you. Mayor Court? Yes, just the uh, correspondence on our desk today is not directly from the town of Virginia, it's from the North Glenn right. Forest Alliance. It just included the uh, resolution that was passed, I will say not unanimously, at, uh, at the town. Um, but uh, Council Regional Council Grassi is correct, there is a report that in our recommendations we did not specify to be sent here. And, and it should. You should have a copy of that because it was a well-written report. Um, it does talk about the concerns that some of us have raised here in terms of, you know, lack of the public uh, involvement and concern about uh, source water protection. Uh, does speak to uh, concerns uh, that in some cases there are some areas, I'm sorry, looking beside me here, that it makes sense to make some changes. However, the resolution that we um, did secondly, separately was dealing with Schedule 10 of, of uh, Bill 66 and the concerns that uh, many of us had around our council table that um, there was uh, too much in that motion, too much in that bill that, that had issues uh, in terms of uh, the lack of public consultation and the um, uh, ability for uh, uh, development applications not to have regard for policies and plans that we all felt were, were important. And I, and I get it from other members of this council that you know, we all stand strong today on, 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 on protecting those, those policies and dealing with um, development applications that would have regard to it. My concern is that the bill doesn't say that. The bill could let a municipality go forward and do something that perhaps would have impacts that would, uh, would be detrimental to the environment detrimental to a neighboring municipality. So I think we need to send uh, the report that we did, as Regional Councilor Garazzi indicated, that should come down to this council, um, to uh, staff, to be able to be part of that bigger discussion. Good, okay, and I, so I misunderstood. I, um, I'm hearing now because uh, this group has sent this to us, and we try to get it on the agenda, so we, the clerk does what he can, and, and uh, we understand that yours is coming, so we will deal with it in two weeks' time. Um, when it comes, we'll take it directly to the council on that. So uh, yes, I understand now where it's coming from. So I, I misunderstood uh, on that. So I, I do apologize. So, um, so just all we now is to receive it at this time. That's all we're going to do. Okay, uh, Councillor Grassi, you'll receive that this time. Okay, all those in favor? Against the motion's carried. Okay, that was.